Okay, everybody. Um, today we have a special lunch seminar. Um, this is the second of what I would call a kind of history of gifts seminar. The first was given by Michael Allison last year. Before is going to give this about this semester, and I hope to get maybe David Ryan or Jim or somebody to give a talk uh, the following semester. Uh, Vittorio has insisted on using some technology that I used to use in the late 80s. So just in case it breaks and we have a few moments of failure, I have three different kinds of light bulbs and I hope one of them will work to get this machine working. Uh, Dr. Canuto, oh yes sir? So what are you going to do if the clay tablets shatter? If the clay tablets shatter, Dr. Canuto will fire some new ones in his kiln in his office. Downstairs. Take a few minutes. Or how about the cave paintings that have, you know, triple <laughs> <laughs> I have a blackboard if you okay. want to do sketches. Yeah. It's okay. no problem. And All our right. camera can capture images on this faint technology. But it's kind of hard to get the images of the hippos and what it's are no now problem. arid environments. We can do it. We can, we're can. we capable. Okay. This is NASA after. I'm not going to talk too much about Vittorio's career, other than to say that Vittorio got his PhD in 1961 from the University of Genoa. And uh, he came to join us at GIS in what year exactly was it? Uh, the, the beginning. Of in the beginning. Yeah, let me tell you. I got to GIS on January 1968. <coughs> you take 2014 minus 1968, and you get a pretty good idea how long I've been in this country. <laughs> When I got to get Jasper was the director, Jim Hansen and I were postdoc, and uh, now that he left, well, he was retired. Turns out to be the oldest man of this of this bit. Now January of uh, 1968 was a moment of great excitement because in 1967, the year before, uh, Jocelyn Bell and Tony Hewis had uh, announced the discovery of pulsars. But it turns out to be even better than that because the publication of that paper actually occurred on February 24, 1968. So it was two weeks after I arrived here that the paper had been published in nature. As you know, the paper in Star was revolutionary in many more ways than one. It got the Nobel Prize to Anthony Lewis. It so happened that this pulsate, the neutron star, this neutron star, pulsate is uh, rotating. Started, had to be so massive and, and such a high density, and so high density, no mess, high density because they were spinning so fast, if they did, they would break apart. And uh, so it was uh, was realized that the density had to be of the order of nuclear density, which means that one, uh, which is 10 to the 14 gram per cubic centimeter, for those of you who don't remember, but never mind. <laughs> the important thing is that one spoon, one teaspoon full of of the neutral, neutral star matter weighs like the entire population of the Earth, which is seven billion people, including the obese. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty heavy stuff. The maximum height of a mountain on a neutral star is just gravity, maybe a few centimeters or so. And um, when I got here, I was asked, there were several questions being asked by the community. One was, what is, because this, this is this neutral star, very compact, and it's just like a, like a lighthouse, a very, very pointed lighthouse. And whenever it turns around, you catch it. So the, origin, the question was, what is the origin of this, of this beam? That was not a question I could, I was interested because after all, I had to follow the suggestion of my advisor who told me to work on something else. But Mel Ruderman here from Colombia has been working on that for many years. So uh, is the world expert today. If you have any questions, he will give you that answer. I was asked to work on the magnetic field and later on on the mass of the new star. In other words, there were these three questions. The first one was the beam, well, which mechanism produced this fine beam. What was the strength of the magnetic field and what was the physics in those magnetic fields? What was the maximum mass of that new star? Only two who was my uh, advisor here who brought me here for six months asked me to look into the matter of neutral stars. Magnetic field. The magnetic field of neutral stars could be of the order of 10 to the 13 Gauss. 
simply because if you take a star like the sun and then you contract it to the size of a neutron star, which is about 10 kilometers, the size of Manhattan, and since the flux, conservation of flux in BR squared, it goes like one over R squared. So if you take the ratio of the sun to, to 10, which is 10 to 10 centimeters, to 10 kilometers, you take that squared, you get the magnetic field of the order of 10 to 13 galaxies. So how does matter look in, if you put it under that, those conditions? They asked me to look at the equation of state. I had no idea how to compute the equation of state. So I went and asked many wi very wise people in Europe. The first one we contacted at Yeshiva was Freeman Dyson. And after I, um, I explained everything and asked him how to do it, he says we could not have it. He had no idea how to do it. Then I talked to George Ullenberg at Rockefeller. George Ullenberg is the one who discovered the spin of the electron in 1925. Since the Dutch have a famous tradition of statistical mechanics, he was a famous statistical mechanic. Later I also asked him, and he also said that he had no, no idea how to, how to do it. So um, if you look at the, the, the by the way, the Dirac equation, which means the relativistic equation of an electron in a magnetic field of arbitrary strength, had been solved in the late 20s by I. I. Rabi, who was professor at, at, at Columbia. So the wave function was, was known, and what to do with that wave function was the problem. Now, more or less, when you have a magnetic field that is uniform in the z direction, if you put an electron in there, it will, there is a process called Spaghettification. I don't know what science will do without Italian language. <laughs> <laughs> From neutrino to pizza. <laughs> so this electron is freely moving up and down, but in the direction of perpendicular magnetic field, it's extremely confined. Like in an harmonic oscillator. So the very tiny orbit, they can move up and down, but not laterally. <coughs> which meant that the concept of pressure is kind of vague because pressure is a scalar, but here you will have you will have difference, so you cannot call it pressure. It also meant that the heat, that there was a transport of heat, it would be very different in one direction or the other. So there's a lot of fun doing all this kind of. Uh, so the wave function, it may be like a free particle in the z direction, and an harmonic oscillator in the in the x and y direction. So I did, you know, so I asked all these people, nobody knew how to do it, and had no idea how to do it. Then, then something tragic happened, as you well know, on um, April fourth. 1968, which was a few months after I arrived here, they, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And uh, it was at 6 p.m. in Tennessee, and uh, here was perhaps an hour earlier. The point is that, late, it was it at around 7 o'clock or so, the FBI came by the Institute, which at that time still had not been outside, and asked them to go home. Because it was the time in which there were a lot of demonstrations on Broadway, the colonies were the end of the Vietnam War, and so they did this. Nobody knew what was going on. There was a lot of outrage, a lot of violence, and those who remember it, that evening the mayor of New York went without the score, all by himself, to walk up and down on the 25th Street. Um, mayor Winston, and he showed a great deal of courage, and he quieted down and lowered the temperature, which would have been far too high. Anyway, they sent us home and they told us to come back on Tuesday, just to be on the safe side. Just as a precaution, I met. I was living in a free bag hotel on 103rd Street, so it was really unpleasant to have to take all the books and everything and go home and stay there, which I did, because I had no choice. So at one evening, I decided very unwisely to cook dinner for myself, and uh, it was a major disaster, but I had Nightmare during the night, except that finally I realized that I could compute that that uh, energy momentum tensor uh, using the wave function that Ravi and other people had derived. And indeed, I did that with an approximation. So the gas of the electron in a magnetic field could very well be, be computed. That was um, the only person I couldn't consult was Matt Ruderman. But if I remember correctly, my you were in Sabbatical in London. I'm sorry, okay. you told me that. So, um, so uh, once uh, the equation of state had been derived, which means the pressure in the z direction, the pressure in the x direction for an arbitrary 
state of, of uh, temperature and, uh, and density because that was included in the Fermi distribution. Then uh, there were other problems. For example, the question was, how would a nitrogen atom, if you put instead of a free electron, if you put a nitrogen atom inside the magnetic field, what would happen to it? Would the binding energy of the electron to the proton go up or down? And um, without magnetic field, it's about 13.6 electron volts, if I remember correctly. But in a nitrogen atom, it has to be larger simply because this electron in a three dimensional space. When an electron moves, sometimes it passes near the neutral, sometimes it doesn't. But in a one dimensional situation, which is forced, every time it moves, it's forced to go by the proton. But the interaction is larger, and therefore the binding must go up. And Mel Rudeman was the first one to solve the hydrogen atom, which cannot be solved exactly because magnetic fields are the same in different symmetry. The Coulomb interaction as a, as a, as a spherical symmetry, so there's no coordinates. Mel Rudeman solved the problem with the variation of matter, and um, I think he got about 160, 162 uh, electron volts. So it was a big jump between 13. We also did it at the same time here, but um, we there we have somebody who sold the hydrogen atom in America, but we get basically the same result. Then the, the question was, what do we do with all this knowledge that we have? Well, with Matt Rudeman, we published four papers, one on the cooling of, pu of pulsars, one on the Thomson scattering, because the Thomson scattering, electron photon scattering, the photon has nothing to do with magnetic field, but the electron has. And so we studied the Thomson scattering. Then we published a paper on the longitudinal plasma neutrinos and the photon opacity at the surface of the neutral star. In the last paper we published together was 74, 30 years ago, man. And we're still more or less alive after those experiences. So um, we spent several years working on those problems. Then finally went to, to the second problem, which was that of the neutral star mass. How big is a neutral star? How, how big can it be? After all, inside the neutral star, the reason why gravity doesn't collapse the whole thing to a black hole is because neutrons and protons repel each other at short distances. How strong do they repel each other? And how do you put the proton? Oh, because they call it neutral star, but, but there are also some few percentages of proton in order to make sure that the neutron don't decay because the neutrons are a stable part. So we call the neutral star, but that's okay. Anyway, so we worked on this many body it was a many body problem using the best possible nuclear nuclear interaction that we could find at that time. And um, so we worked several years on um, on that um, finally in nineteen seventy four we were invited to the Solvay conference in Belgium. And Rudin was there too. And uh, the Solvay conference is a famous conference because the first one you know the history was what, 1913 or 14? Einstein. Yeah. Einstein was there. Anyway, Solvay is the gentleman from uh, Belgium who came in the chemical industry producing uh, detergent, basically. All over Europe, the word detergent is synonymous with the word Solvay or vice versa. So it was an interesting conference because the king of Belgium, King Waldo, was there because he's a so we, we loved astronomy, and he died later. Anyway, at that conference of which I brought here the proceeding, something unexpected happened. Leo <coughs> Rosenfeld, who had been a collaborator with, uh, of Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, made a short intervention, about half a page, which served to confuse everybody for many, many years. Because he said that as far as his nature was concerned, Landau, the great physicist, over in Michael Dubovic, who was a graduate student, and Landau came up with the concept of neutral star, which is called <coughs> real star, it's in German, so he presented it. In the conversation with Bohr and Rosenfeld, after they knew that the neutron had been discovered. That was have to be incorrect, because Chadwick, who discovered the neutron, sent a letter dated February 24, 1932, to Bohr in Copenhagen. Bohr was there leaving God of quantum mechanics in But in 1932, February, when he sent the letter, neither Bohr, nor Sommerfeld, nor much less Landau were in Copenhagen. So the letter was lying there on, on the desk. So Landau was not there, Bohr was not there, etc. So what was the Landau contribution? Well, 
It turns out that somebody has written a paper recently clarifying the whole thing. The, uh, in January 7, 1932, Landau submitted a paper to the on the, but he had written the paper in 1931, but for some reason he never did anything with that paper. So that paper was published on February 29, 1932. The letter of the discovery was on February 24, so it was five days after the discovery. But certainly Landau showed a great deal of imagination, power of thing, even though it, it's not <coughs> true that he wrote it after. He wrote it simultaneously, so he didn't really he didn't really follow what Rosenfeld must have, must have confused him. Certainly there was a meeting between, between Landau and, and Bohr, etc., but that must have been after it could not have been. Anyway, the maximum star, the maximum mass of neutral star was a subject of great interest. So doing the best that we could, we came up with a number that everybody came up more or less with a number of the other three solar masses is the most that you can hope the nuclear forces will keep your stuff. And if a supernova explodes and the mass the leftover is more than that, well too bad it becomes a it becomes a black hole. Now considering black holes, I would like to read you what John Archibald Wheeler and Kenneth Ford wrote in their autobiography. Before the book came out, which is um, I forget what the book is I'll tell you. Uh, 19, 19. Kenneth Ford, who was the co biographer, called me up and said, We are about to write a chapter on, on black holes. And he said, that General Archibald Wheeler would like to know if you remember <coughs> that he invented that name talking with you. And I said, Just a second, I said, I remember the talk that General Archibald Wheeler gave at this, uh, this place because I had invited him. I remember that after the talk we were in my office and he came up with this word. Black holes, which surprised me because I never heard it before. But I, how could I possibly know that was the first time they gave us that? That I cannot vouch. Besides, I said, how do you know that it was after this talk? So, oh, because the United States is very careful. He's got a diary, and on the way back to Princeton, he wrote in the diary, today he finally came up with a term which is so concise and so beautiful. And he says here, in fall of 1967, which is wrong because I wasn't even. I was about to say born, but I mean, I wasn't even here. So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I was invited to give a talk in the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, 2880 Broadway. And what are the pulses, the vibration, the rotating neutral star, etc. And I came up with this thing, which is certainly true. He did. Did now, you say that was autobiographical memoir? You said someone in the audience shouted it out. Yeah, that is exactly. That is a, the other thing that is not true. I don't remember because I was there directing the traffic during this talk. <laughs> and nobody, nobody, did, he, nobody did that. He, oh, if somebody did, he didn't say black hole. Black hole is said the first time in my office. That I'm positive. But much as he, he uh, so this 1967 is wrong. I don't think it was 1968 either. So I think it was a year after, after that. But you know, that's that's our story. Never mind. That's uh, that's how black holes. He, this gentleman here, claims that it's not true. The black hole was actually a term was invented before that. I don't know. I just tell you what. Anyway, we ended up publishing uh, two review articles on uh, on review of astronomy and astrophysics simply because Hess Pinker had published two articles on convection stars. So he said, "The hell if I let you be me." So I wrote two articles. <laughs> See, you're a bad example. Here. So on uh, ultra high state equation of state, part one and part two, of course this article is much better than mine, without any doubt. So this was part two, was 1975. After which, after which, I um, I spent the sabbatical in the uh, News Board Institute. Because here we had a man called Al Cameron, a really great guy, both, both personally and scientifically, who um, actually had written the article for the Soviet conference with Al Kamra, who, who said that he had been invited to go to Copenhagen at the Nisbor Institute where there is a great deal of knowledge on nuclear physics. It was a place where nuclear physics was at the best. But uh, they wanted somebody who could walk both sides of the street, so 
They said, yeah, I can go. He said, come here, I suggest your name. And they invited me there. And I, um, and I went there. Talking about Newton Star, talking about this and that. And that's the second phase of my life. I went there, and um, there is a, there was, I don't know if it still is, a very good um, tradition in Cop at the Nice Board Institute that every month uh, all the postdocs get together and um, they give talk on a subject that is not their specialty. But some article they write in the literature which turn out to be very interesting. And therefore they give that talk in order to. I had uh, read, I have seen an article in the monthly, no, in the Royal uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1975 by Dirac. And I read the article, I thought I understood it, and that's always an illusion when you read Dirac's paper, <laughs> because then it turns out that. Anyway, I started my now just a few a few simple biographical notes for those of you who know. Dirac was born in Bristol in August 8, 1902, and he died in, no, in October 20, 1984 in Tallahassee, Florida, where he was <coughs> where he was a professor. Um, in 1928 he produced the Dirac equation, which put together special relativity and quantum mechanics. In 1930, he suggested the possibility of <coughs> antimatter. And after Anderson discovered yeah, proper, in 1933, he was awarded the Nobel Prize with Schrodinger. So whenever whenever the Rao was introduced in the Nobel Prize, he always pointed out he only had 50% of the Nobel Prize. Was with them. So after reading the W, coming back to New York, I decided to invite Dirac to, um, to this. This is a picture of Dirac in Tallahassee. You recognize the people. This was a course that was not Dirac. This was your student chair, you remember? And there was Dirac, it was me, it was another student actually. He took us to a visit to, to visit um, visit a few places in Tallahassee. So I invited him to come to New York. I wasn't sure he would accept because, you know, where should he come from? And here is his letter that says, handwritten. He never used a typewriter. I don't think he knew there was such a thing. <laughs> but the important thing is that the straight, uh, they're, all, they're all the same line. You know? Unless you use some trick, I wish I was able to write like that. The same thing would suit me very well for my talk at your institute. If you want a, a title, I would suggest this. Does the gravitational constant vary? I find it would be not convenient to travel from Tallahassee in the same day, so we may arrive at LaGuardia at 1.56. <laughs> and if not too much, <laughs> constant, I think that better travel. My wife will be coming with me, and so there's several people that you want to see in New York. Well, I took him to the, of course I picked it up, I took him to a hotel downtown, and the lady at the hotel was so obnoxious because he kept on saying, give me your, some ID. And I said, but it's already been paid, everything, you know, no, no, no. You didn't have a passport. At one point she said, oh, okay, okay, okay. She said, never mind, give me your passport. Uh, give me your driving license. And the racket is your man and looked at her and, and he said, I flew here. <laughs> 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 she didn't she didn't get it. <laughs> 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 she didn't. But that was the kind of answer that we would. So what was his talk here at this? Well his talk was basically this. Is there an absolute clock in nature? That's what obsessed him for many years of his life. As a matter of fact, his wife suggested to me, told me that this idea he had it during honeymoon in 1937. His wife was the sister of Eugene Wigner, the Hungarian Nobel Prize physicist also. So the poor woman was between her and her. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember one day another opportunity when I took the rush to the hotel and then we went there to his room and then he said let's go out. I said why? Because in a few minutes there would be a lot of screaming and stuff. I said why? Because my wife is Hungarian. She's going to call her brother and they're going to shout to each other. By definition Hungarian cannot talk to her. So we went out a few minutes later, she was talking, you know, get it to his brother in a rather animated 
So we didn't listen to the conversation, even if we did, we wouldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the idea that the Russia had made very simple was the following. If you take an atom like an electroplasm the positron, the spring of this clock, which is an atomic clock, of course, depends on the charge of the electron, the Planck constant, the mass, etc. It's an atomic clock. But the atomic clock had been in use only in the last 50 to 60 years, before 4,000 years, people used gravitational clock. Uh, the moon going around the earth, going around the sun, the galaxy, all that. So the gravitational clock, the spring in this case, is the gravitational G, the gravitational clock. And, uh, so the Iraq asked himself, and I repeat what he said here, if this is the atomic, if the atomic clock and this is the gravitational clock, are they, why are they synchronized? And if they are synchronized, why are they synchronized? All right, that was his, uh, that was his question. And uh, he also backed it up with another argument, which became known as a large number hypothesis. He said, if you take, we did an hydrogen atom uh, here in 1937. If you take the electric force and divide it by the gravitational attraction between the two particles, this one is 10 to the 40 times larger than the other. That's why you never take gravity into account when you do atomic physics. Now, it turns out that if you measure the age of the universe, whatever it is, 13, 14 billion years, not in years, which is not a, 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 an atomic time, it's a gravitational time, but if you measure it in atomic time, define, for example, the time it takes light to go from one side of the electron to the other, or any such measure, it turns out that the age of the universe in those units is 10 to the 40. So the Rex said, okay, look. This is that to four, and this is that to four. Never mind about that. So today, which means zero, these two numbers are of the same order. <coughs> if you assume that that is the assumption, that this has been valid all the time, we take the zeros out, then you get this. And then it comes out that the gravitational constant, with respect to atomic law, not with respect to gravitational law, the gravitational constant with respect to atomic law could vary like one of the true or false. That was his question. Okay? Now, at that time, there was a. Well, we started talking about that, and I started working on this a little bit, so I made the story short. So I was interested to hear that you're considering the possible variation of the weak coupling constant. Most people just assume automatically that such constant can vary with ghosts, right? Again, my idea. The variation we have. I still have the original of this recipe. So uh, um, I see by the paper you sent me that you're actively following the effect of variation. And so far, you don't seem to have run into any serious debate. You're sincerely PM. Okay, fine. So he was very supportive of the fact that there was somebody <coughs> who was. Uh, another letter from Tallahassee that says, Time for your article. I wrote an article for you scientist, and he said it is nicely written. That's as much as far as you could possibly go. <laughs> <laughs> it's nicely written, which is a super duper compliment, you know. <laughs> um, many people in the physics world know that Dirac was famous for being extremely taciturn. And there's actually even a unit of one Dirac, which is one word. An hour, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, <something like> <laughs> and, I, and asked him why. Yes. He told me the story, that which is which is then repeated in many places. That when he was when he was a kid, his father, who was Swiss, his mother was British, but his father was Swiss. His father insisted that he speak French, and since he didn't feel very comfortable with the French he spoke, he said, "I rather don't talk." And he didn't talk. <laughs> and that was um, oh, anyway. He says, I do not agree that the president is, oh, because at that time, after this radical came up in New Zealand, Scientific America contacted us, asked him whether we wrote the joint paper. And he said, I don't think, and I pass on to you, I don't agree that the president is a good time to propagate the idea of G value. It all depends on Shapiro. Irving Shapiro was the guru on measurement at MIT, and so we had to depend on his measurement. If Shapiro says, yes, we can go ahead <coughs> with confidence. He said, Peter says, no, we must think again. In the meantime, it is best to be quiet, which for him was very easy. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter told me in New York that he is now give, give, going, 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 
Goin, Goin, to combine the Viking observation on Mars with the previous Mariner run, and he hopes to have a definite answer about where the Jeep Harris and Sisman's are. The Viking observation are not sufficient by themselves because the time base is too short. You're sincerely. Okay, fine. So that was the state of the art of that. Then, in another letter, he says, I'm enclosing. I was asking for uh, money from NSF, and I asked him to write a letter. He did. And he wrote, he wrote a very nice letter to NSF, which I showed you in a few seconds. And um, again, I, here is still the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'll, I'll give it to you right here. From that place where I have been interested in for several years in the question. This was not to me, it was to answer. In the question of whether the GDA test are not subject to a slow variation. Dr. has been working on this problem. We had much correspondence about it and number of personal discussions. And has brought in several interesting and then he changed it to valuable. <laughs> <laughs> interesting is too much. <laughs> valuable idea, because a valuable idea, but okay, anyway. It is it's an important question of general physics and much work on it remains to be done. So I very much hope that you will be able to solve <coughs> this further work, uh, which uh, was never funded. <laughs> and I don't think so, at least I don't remember. But then the major problem the Iraq had was actually not with this, but was Tether. Tether is another of those Hungarian geniuses that come to this country. And he wrote a paper in <coughs> Physical Review in 1948, 11 years after the Iraq had not put the first suggestion, saying that the Iraq is completely wet, it doesn't work. Because it says, if you take any textbook or in, um, in uh, astrophysics, you make dimensional analysis, just the equation, it turns out the luminosity of a star goes at the seventh power of G, and the field power of m. Therefore, the flux goes like g to the 9 because the radius, the distance goes from 1 on the one on g. So the temperature is 9 fourths. You go and put this 3 billion years ago, uh, the temperature will be 400 degrees, the water will boiling, the ocean will boiling. That's not true, and therefore the idea is wrong. He also came up with another idea, Taylor, namely that if the gravitational constant had been going the way that he suggested, in order for the star to, the gravity was so strong, in order not to collapse, the internal energy source must have been also be burning at a faster rate. But if you burn a faster rate, you use it up all the time. Therefore, the star today, instead of being an M star, it would be a, a kind of a red giant. So you turn on the window, you look, it's not a red giant. <laughs> That's it. Simple as that. And that, that took a lot of, a lot of um, so Dirac asked me to look into that problem. That was his third problem. And he said, if you get a solution, you go and see Teller at Liverpool, which was the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> because I went there and I was treated like a dirt by Edward Teller. I was really treated so bad, you won't imagine. Teller used to have around him a group of people who smiled synchronously and tried synchronously with him. <laughs> <laughs> they would do exactly the same thing that he would do. So even though he knew that it was coming because, because Dirac had told him, he refused to uh, see me, but at lunch. And at lunch, he had all these all this minions and, 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 and that were around him. Very impressive. Then he said, well, you don't have clearance, so I cannot see you until 4 o'clock at the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> because the swimming pool was a public place. So I went there, I explained what I wanted to do, and he treated me like that. I said, Professor Taylor, that's fine, thank you. Tonight I'm going back to New York. I'll tell the rack the nice treatment I received. But you cannot escape it because I'm going to write the paper. I'm going to send to physical review or astrophysical journal, and you're going to be the referee anyway. So what's the point of doing all this, all this, all this business? So he he was then the referee. And he had. Now the question was the following: that if you take a little bit technically, if you take <coughs> if you take Einstein equation, the geometry of the left, this is the rigid tensor. On the left, on the left, on the right, you have the energy momentum tensor. Since that's the Einstein equation was constructed this way, first of all, we represent the geometrical part and then the matter. So the matter goes the geometry and vice versa. Now, it so happened that the rich tensor constructed this way has a zero, has a zero derivative. 
So the right hand side must also have the left hand side a zero covariant derivative, so the right hand side must also have zero covariant derivative. Now, if you take g out, uh, this is the whole trick. If you take g out, if g is a constant, then you, this becomes this. And this becomes a, co a conservation law, out of which you can get all the thermodynamics you want for a gas, etc., etc. So the people who, like Taylor, who contradicted the right, who said that he was wrong, actually did this mistake of <coughs> taking all these conservation law, which were valid only for constant g, which are coming from here, and applied in a situation which it was not called. So of course they get the result which it made no sense. And so that that was the if you do it properly, as we did in our paper, then it turns out that the luminosity, if you keep all the G and an M together, at the end you get the luminosity goes like GM to the seven divided by GM squared, which is constant because under those conditions GM is constant. G never appears by itself, it always appears with M. And the conservation law is that GM is constant. And therefore, and therefore, it did prove absolutely nothing. They didn't prove that the drug was wrong. They didn't prove that the drug was right. But certainly, certainly, they could not claim that they had proven the drug wrong. So in order to do that, so he was very pleased that the, of this result, notwithstanding my my insult, an injury that they suffered from from terror, whom I never liked anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the paper that we published with one of his postdoc students on the cosmological variation of gene disorder. You know, here we show exactly the result they showed before. Within Einstein theory, it makes no sense whatsoever to talk about variation of gene because it's always GM and GM is constant, so you prove absolutely nothing. If you want to do something, then you have to do something much more complicated than that, which I will not bother you with because it's really cool. You get color enough for your part? No, no, but I think it was the referee, but the paper went through, yeah. I asked him whether it was. So once we, so it was a great period because we could, um, we could um, send the paper, the referee come back and said, oh yeah, yeah, you proved that G is compatible with, say, supernova counter of, of radio source, et cetera. But you didn't prove this. So we were getting good feedback from the referee, so we live off the referee for several years. I think they ran out of excuses. So after several years, we had convinced ourselves that the variation energy was perfectly compatible <coughs> with all we knew, which doesn't mean that it was needed. I mean, compatibility is one thing, but it does not mean it's required. So the, the critical task was to convince the people who had the real tool to do the experiment, which they never did before, because they said, well, there are so many astrophysical properties you guys have been solved, then you better show that the idea is at least compatible with what we know before we launch it. And that's what we did. And then the bad news came. Because um, so the Reagan administration decided to turn off Vikings because it was costing too much, right? Of course it was. Um, so I told Dirac to write a letter to George Keyworth, who was the science advisor Reagan. George Keyworth was a plasma physicist, came from Los Alamos, so he certainly knew who Dirac was. So there yeah, was wrote this nice letter. I wrote the letter. He signed. <laughs> he would never have written a letter like that. It's, if you read it, it's too, it's too Italian. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enjoy. he says actually it would be it's tragic. Imagine if you would, but he signed it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, he said, such an actual. I understand from economic re economic reason that one remaining Viking land is to be discontinued in October first, 1982. I recently read the little bags, Marx, and B.I. Hassel, and other headquarters, to point out that such action would put an end to most relevant knowledge presently carried out jointly by scientists, two NASA centers, JPL in this New York. He explained why. He told me he was going to write the letter and he was expecting no answer. Well, we had no email at that time, but here's the answer that came in real fast. The White House. Thank you so much for your letter with the Viking letter. I agree with you that discontinuing this valuable experiment would not be a wise decision. And I was pleased to find out that NASA has in fact made plans to ensure its continued operation. I appreciate you bringing this to my attention. Science advisor to the president. <laughs> so that was a, the NASA people also replied, I had the letter, but they're all the same. So yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So finally we went to the real 
to the real nitty gritty. So we convinced the people at JPL to analyze the data that they had. These people had 1,136 range measurement to Viking <coughs> back and forth from Mars to the 65 range measurement, blah, 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 blah. What they do, they take the equation, Newton's equation, of particularly relativistic form in some cases, of the entire solar system, and using the super duper number of data, they determine everything the mass of the planet, the distance, and everything. So we simply ask them to do the same thing, but adding one more variable, which is the variation of g. Finally, they decided to do it because an interesting thing to do. And um, <coughs> in, uh, we published a joint paper from, from JPL and here in New York, experimental test of the variability of g using Viking land and range data. Well, here's the result. The variation of G, to, never mind the body, turns out to be at least 10 times smaller than what the Iraq had won. So that was the end. That was the end. But it was a, of course, the Iraq was discarded, but he didn't show it because uh, it was not very British to show any kind of discontent or disapproval. But he told me that the idea was too beautiful not to be, and he, um, that was 1980. What was beta? Beta is the ratio between the two, gravi the two times. The gravitation of time and the Einstein time. The, this paper was published in uh, October 1983. The Iraq died October 1984. So for one year, we kept on conversing here and there with him, etc. But um, of course, that was a great disappointment. But at least, I, in a sense, I. Not only I learned the undeserved honor of talking to the Iraq on a regular basis, even though the gap between his brain and my brain was uh, a cosmological size, but <laughs> the fact that the fact that um, this is one of the rare experiments in your life as a scientist that you say that's it. Mm -hmm. I did all that I could. The experiment showed it's not true. Forget it. Just change the subject. And that's it. Usually there's all linked. It perhaps people do this, people do that. But in this case, this is. There's nothing to it. There's nothing. It's not a factor of two. It's a factor of more than almost a hundred facts. So it just, it just not there. That's it. So I, I, uh, we, um, we there, there, was, there was a closing of a period in which I learned a great deal from him. I learned a great deal from what this experiment that we did. And the end was, uh, the end was not what we expected. But uh, you know, you can, you can never. That was 1983. It was a, Of course, I was very depressed too. Because you know, come on, you work for seven years and then you end up with a negative not result, so you, you're not exactly happy, but it's okay. Anyway, now it's okay, and that time it was. In March 1983, <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting, in 19 March 1983, Reagan came up with the, with the idea of Star Wars. You're too young to know that, but it was such. <laughs> Uh, called SDI, it was not called Star Wars. The Star Wars was written in the New York Times next morning because Senator Kennedy called it Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Which uh, the proposal was to to have a to have a shield against the rising continental ballistic missile that would come to this country. Mel Rudiman has worked on that, so he knows much more than I do. But anyway, the point was that um, I heard that. Uh, a round table, there was only two people in that table. One was Edward Teller, again, the immortal, <laughs> gave a presence, and Garwin, which is a common friend to all of us. And Richard Garwin, who said, I am a scientist who lives in a planet in which one plus one makes two. That was in Bikini Center. Like saying that Teller was living in La La Land. Which was true. <laughs> and Garwin is a real expert. You know, he didn't know the ways about that. He simply pointed out to, to Teller that if you really want to have a missile defense against the intercontinental ballistic missile. But all the time that you have is 20 seconds. Because when the ballistic missile goes up, what is called the boost phase, it's about 20 seconds in which you have a lot of infrared radiation, so something you can see. After 20 seconds, the, the, the intercontinental ballistic missile can, can spew out so many decoy that it becomes almost impossible, hopeless, to know which one is which. So the defense. So if you want to catch in the first 20 and since the earth happened to be round, 
you cannot put, you have to put the laser right there where, where it goes. So you have to put the laser right in space, which would go against all provision of the United Nations. But the regular military reverse, but try to undermine all this and prepare themselves for the critic by saying that the ABM treaty, which one the, the ABM to the anti ballistic missile treaty, the ABM treaty that forbids any country, was actually be, had been violated by the Russians. And they went into a long detailed series of papers in which they showed that the Krasnoyar Reticato was actually in violation and therefore they had the right to defend us. So it was a big, big complete dispute. So was so interested in the physics they were discussing, etc. <coughs> and I also realized that there was a lot of things that were not factual. For example, I was reading the Italian newspaper where they were saying, oh, it's a great idea, not because they thought of it, but because they were hoping that out of that it would come a lot of money from the Pentagon, contract money, you know, to produce this and this and this gadget, which was true. But too bad they didn't read the fine print. The fine print of the law of the Pentagon says, unless there is an American company that, that cannot do it. Of course there's always an American company that can do it. So this guy were living in, in Disney World. So <laughs> I decided that that was not that. So I started studying this problem a little bit. And uh, as usual, you get caught up in this. And when you don't know something, they said you're supposed to teach a course. In my case, I wrote a book, which is called The Nuclear Paradox, which is only entitled. And I wrote this book, and um, from my own satisfaction, I had no, had no political. Uh, as a matter of fact, all the reviewers said, "Nice book, but we had no idea what the author wanted to say." I said, "Just exactly." <laughs> 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 yeah, because it was not my. I really gave all the facts, and I let the readers to read the story. Why the? Why hasn't the reader given us his opinion? I says, "Who am I to give opinion? I'll give you the fact. You've been baptized, so you know how to put one one together, you do it yourself. And uh, the best compliment that I need, or in my opinion. But the spin off of that is that that book got wind in it, it was a newspaper in the Senate, etc. But it also, in the Vatican, was most, because the regular administration was after the Pope, he wanted the Pope to say something about the morality of what Reagan was suggesting. And there was this famous ambassador, Walter, you have to young to know who he was, was an ambassador at the United Nations, who spoke 15 languages, was a military man, etc., who was um, really insisting that the, the Pope should say something, because Reagan was actually offering a defense, whereas the ABN treaty was saying there's no such a thing as a defense in a nuclear era. So they were after him. So they asked me, why don't you come and brief us on your book if you spend so much time? So I did. But then they said, okay, why don't you organize a meeting in workshop in the Vatican, paid by us, uh, with 20 people, no more than that, <coughs> 10 against, 10 in favor, and then you come up with a document. Well, I said, fine, I did it. But I, we needed an after dinner speech. So somebody suggested, I don't remember who, suggested that Arthur Clark, uh -huh. who's right here, <coughs> Arthur C. Clark, <coughs> the one who wrote 2001, All This in Space, would be the right man to give the after dinner speech. He came, he gave his book to the Pope, and as you can see, that's the way the hand shake. It doesn't give you the full hand because he's shaking so many hands. At the end of the day, it's tired, so I give it just full fingers. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they told me when I, I pointed that out. Anyway, that, that was a nice experience. He was a, was a, he was famous uh, not only because of his book, but because he is the one who poised the geostationary orbit by saying that if you put satellite in geostationary orbit, communication in the world would be. Would be, would be uh, so he's famous for the geostationary orbit, sometimes called called the Clark orbit, even though it's there in the in the uh, in the uh, Kepler equation. But he's the one who was very powerful man who retired to Sri Lanka at the age of um, very young, and he lived very life in, um, in Sri Lanka. We pulled him out of. So in uh, this, the last phase of my life, which is still alive, I'm going to send you now. <laughs> After all this, I remember I had heard a talk by Heisenberg at Columbia around 1974 or so. I don't know if you remember. It was Columbia Heisenberg, of course, the room was jam packed, you know, talking about the fundamental problem of physics, and I expect the usual litany, you know, quantization of general relativity, neutrinos, and electric particles, which he did. But then, as a third problem in the list, was turbulence. So I waited in line in the queue, like everybody, and I went there and asked him what he meant. And he said, well, if you really want to begin studying turbulence, you can begin with my doctoral thesis. I thought he was 
for in my life because I thought that as a doctoral this year was this invented quantum mechanics. But it turns out that was not true. In 1924, this thesis, which we have translated here in the library for some reason at the time we had, the thesis in 1924 with Sommerfeld was actually, I don't remember was China flow or quiet flow, but it was the stability of a language. 1920, 1924, in 1925, he invented what I call quantum mechanics. Right? Chancellor. Oh, no, excuse me, pipe. Pipe. Yeah. So was the we saw the old summer, anyway. In 1927, he invented the uncertainty principle. This guy was everywhere. In 1932, he got the Nobel Prize. And in 1942, he invented the S matrix, without which Michael would be without the job. <laughs> 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 but uh, at the same time, this young man here, Red Speaker, asked me to give a series of informal lecture in his office on a paper that had just appeared in Annals of Physics by a gentleman called Nakamura. You remember? It was a, was a postdoc. I mean, uh, he written his PhD at the University of Urbana, Illinois, and he written this very nice article on Annals of Physics. And um, Charles, what it usually is, Red Speaker asked me to read that paper and present it to him. Now, which I did. And I, I get hooked up in this diagram, Feynman diagram uh, approach to, uh, to Navier-Stokes equation. It was just, it was just very nice. Then, in, then in, it turns out, that was late day, but it turns out in 1961, the same man here, as we had written a paper called On the Spectrum of Turbulent Convection, which was in Ledoux, which is a very nice interesting <coughs> paper because I finally understood so I started off with this turbulence business without knowing what kind of I was going to. From I, for some reason, Jim Mass and I discussed that. He said, "Well, if you do something, do it first with the atmospheric, the PBL, planets are wandering there because we need that." So we we went to the first of all, we went to the atmospheric turbulence, which can be driven by shear, convection, shear plus convection. It can be stable stratification, unstable stratification. And I realized that the literature. In, in, in uh, atmospheric science, in terms of pretty sophisticated, like certainly more sophisticated than the one in astrophysics was. And they were all using the um, Reynolds stresses. Reynolds stresses simply means, and here I will give you, if you take any field, like a velocity field, you separate into a mean part and a fluctuating part. Now, this division is called the Reynolds split, but for some patriotic reason, I'm going to tell you that that's not the case. Actually, Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> yes, yes, wrote exactly the same thing, living on one bridge in Florida. Except that Leonardo da Vinci never wrote any equation, he simply drove. And he says, in an English translation, he says, the motion of water resembles that of hair. I know it. Um, he has two motions. One due to the weight of the shaft, the other to the shape of the curl. Thus, water has an eddying motion. One part is due to the principal current, the other to the random and reverse motion. So, anyway, that's called the random stress. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you do that in a Navier-Stokes equation in nonlinear term, with automatic bring correlation term between the turbulent part. Either velocity, velocity, or velocity, temperature, or velocity, salinity, here in the ocean, and so you have all the second-order moment, as they call them, second-order correlation, and uh, which enters in the mean equation for the mean temperature. Mean. So what do you do with that? Well, in 1897, Businesk suggested that could be, for the case of the velocity, could be written as a turbulent velocity times a temperature gradient, which is fine. Well, it was certainly. And this is a turbulent flip, but it was in only 1927 that Alexander Friedman, the same one who solved the Einstein equation for the Friedman universe, at the Congress in Mathematics said, why do you guys stop at the mean momentum equation? Why do, if you take the mean momentum equation, you subtract it from the total, you get the equation for the, for the random stresses, for, for, the, for the turbulent part. Of course, of course, you cannot solve this because these are but if you multiply this by t and multiply this by u, you get the equation for the turbulent flow. So you say you stop kind of too early. That was 1927. Nobody did anything, as far as I can tell, on the random stresses until 1945, 
Wen Chou, Pei Wen Chou, in 1945, published the first paper that was able to find in the Reynolds stresses in, um, in engineering flows, only shear flows. But it's a now, it so happened that the daughter of Cho was working here at the Institute. And um, when it turned 90, we all went to China to celebrate his 90th birthday. It was actually 89, because in China, the crop you start one year earlier at the conception. So I met this great guy who was really the initiator of all this, uh, of all this Reynolds Christ for Shiro. In 1980, Mellor, George Mellor and Yamada, GFDL, Prince, they generalize it to flow of geophysical interest. And they got a hierarchy of equations, and they did really a wonderful job of applying it, etc. It turns out that when it was applied to the ocean in particular, and that was a few years later, it turns out that the mislayer depth, that this equation, that this turbulence pressure was simply too shallow compared to the data. <laughs> For some reason, neither Mellor nor Yamada provided an answer to these two shallow critics. They didn't even define their model. Presumably because there was nothing they could do. At that time, the knowledge of the closure was such that they could not do anything. So, in 1994, KPP, which is being used in the building, uh, decided that since the turbulence was not, was not leading us anywhere, they might as well do something, and they invented the KPP model, the K parameter. Parameter, which has been in, which has been in use and still in use. In two, oh, sorry, in 2001, <coughs> each end, Armando Howard and I realized that a great deal of progress had been made in the closure approximation. So we applied the, the approximation that were known at the time rather than the time of measuring it. Rather, it turns out that the new closure actually gave the mix the initial depth the right size. So it was not an intrinsic defect. Of the methodology, there was no reason to abandon the turbulence closure. <laughs> it's just a question of keeping up with the with the rate with the rate. So in 2010, we then published our GIS vertical mixing model, and um, for the ocean, of course, here you in the ocean you have uh, you want some dirt here. You have, <laughs> you have shear on the surface of the ocean. You have internal gravity wave below the mix layer. You have double diffusion, and at the bottom you have tide. So the mechanism whereby turbulence is being generated there with height in order to take care of all these processes in one single model is the challenge. You know, to make sure that you don't change parameters, change the yield, etc. Because now going back home, if you really want to have a model for climate to use in climate model, you want to have the least number of parameters possible. Because if you have a lot of free parameters, if you fix them to today data, you never know whether in the future climate those parameters are simply the same. So, uh, you know, you have to do something that is as parameter free as possible. And, um, and uh, but then, then, this was 2010, we are still improving, the amount is still improving. Um, in the parlance of turbulence model is still a local model, this is only for the few aficionados here, but we are thinking of But vertical mixing was not the only one, we also went into mesoscale. Mesoscale are structure. The ocean, which are sizes between 10 and 100 kilometers, they live several months. You can see them from satellite very easy. They have a kinetic energy and the kinetic energy of mesoscale, which is larger than the mean kinetic energy. It's a very energetic. Model. They travel non dispersively. That's a major. Problem. In other words, if you have a mesoscale, it can travel for several months, can whatever was inside temperature, heat, salinity, nutrient without dispersion, which is not what, what the Rossby way do. So we needed a parameterization. Which we did. We did with Michael Dubovarkov. And uh, yeah, there's a moment of things. <laughs> and, my, and here, what you said, you showed you two, two slides. Now, what do you do with this model? Well, you have to test them. We use them. We use them. This is this. Why so lousy? This is so good. <laughs> doesn't show up. The color. Just hold that up. Yeah, you see? Yeah, this is the standard, this is the temperature drift. In other words, you start, you code with the surface, surface temperature, you let it run for 300 years, and you want to make sure that there's no drift, because if there is drift, then your model is doing something that should be doing. By standard model, I mean standard model for mesoscale, for vertical mixing, 
I didn't tell you which one because they're almost in the same result. Here is what they give. You know, there's the mono drift and it's very both too, too warm and, and too cold. And our model gives this, which is, which is much better than this. So, um, both in the, in the deep ocean, we will have to five kilometers. So, it has been, it has been, a, it has been a, a good, um, a good um, result for us to find out that our model, when you test in your GCM, Core resolution of GCM, which means a resolution of 100 kilometers, which cannot resolve those scale, the reparameterization of them gives distant results. The last thing I want to tell you is some mesoscale. You know, there's also such an object. They are between 0.1 and 10 kilometers. The data on them are very scanty, there isn't much. They live a few days, so that's why it's uh, so scanty, it's completely agiotrophic. But they generate large vertical motion, much vertical yeah. Yeah, velocity, which can be up to 50 meters per day. Now this has an enormous impact on phytoplankton bloom. Because you know, if phytoplankton is atmospheric, you don't feed in food from the bottom, it will never happen. With this large velocity are, are, are what keeps them alive. And since they absorb, uh, the ocean absorb about 40, 45% of the CO2 that, uh, that we emit to industrial burning of coal, uh, this uh, phytoplankton blooming in absorbed CO2 is uh, significant. So the OGCM and the biogeochemical, uh, they really need to take into account all the subjects for which we have also we also provided a parameterization, but which, uh, but we still have not put them together with these guys in order to make sure that everything is. Well, I passed my time of exactly five minutes. So I'll stop it. I simply cited what he wrote. I mean, I, I cannot go any further than that. As I repeat, I remember he is in black hole. My wife was a postdoc there, so she remembered it, so, so it's not that I was. Uh, but whether he created that term in that moment, or he said that the term black hole was in the literature way before that. Yeah, there's some evidence in one of the early 60s Texas symposium in the term was used. Was you? By? Not by him. Uh, no, not by him. Well, why then did he write it in his memoirs? That it was said by an audience member in the lecture. Yeah, I know. Both in that that that's what, yes, yes, that's what he says. That's exactly what he says. I don't recollect that. Hmm? I don't recollect, I don't know, a lot of questions, but I don't remember him using the word black hole as an answer, honestly. I mean, he went on with his usual charm about this uh, eternal, you know, this uh, completely collapse, all the children. But, um, but then we went to my room and they said, what are you working on? I said, well, a neutral star, what is the mass of mass of a neutral star? Blah, blah, the usual story. Well, if, it is, if it's left over, it's not three sort of mass, it will happen. He came out and said, well, it's going to become a black hole, which I found something an interesting term. But then he said, he died on his way to Princeton, and he wrote it down in his book. So the date is correct. The year is, is, is wrong. Uh, um, and, but, but, but same mistake it was the year was also in the recollection of the people. Were you in the audience? You were in the audience. Do you remember having said that quote? No. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmation <laughs> says certainly, but I, he said someone in the audience said it, and I don't remember that at all. Ah, so you're on my side. <laughs> I'm nowhere. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But no, but you don't remember him saying black hole. No, yeah. I don't. Yeah, remember. that's all my point. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't remember that term coming up in this, in, during during the uh, the seminar on the third floor. But he, but the, okay. So, but also uh, in the, I think in the first Texas conference, I don't remember even saying it then. But there was the mouth was there too. So there was sixty-seven. I, mean, I remember is 
saying black holes have no hair. And they all had no hair. Like oh, yeah. yeah. But what yeah. he said at that meeting, though, uh. about the collapse, he said, this can't happen. Matter will be crushed out of existence and radiated away. Uh. And, uh, and Bryce DeWitt, if you could get to him, would have hit him. Yeah. I see. <laughs> First time I saw him. But it's it back to all the terminologies. Uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps it's uh, Kenneth Ford is still alive. Eh? So I can ask him. But he was not here with him. But, but he, okay, no, but I will now. Because he told me that he wrote in, he had the um, handwritten diary of, of Will. That's what's peculiar about the, the year being wrong. The year being wrong is very peculiar. I come transcribing, fast, transcribing error. I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that John Wheeler was not perfect. <laughs> then Wheeler was one of the greatest guy alive. He come on, he yeah. and he gave a chart. He was charming everybody. But uh, yeah. remember, Copenhagen, we had a meeting. He came in, came up with a magnetic field. He came up with a bouquet of flowers. Then. <laughs> Then he said, well, you'll be surprised that this book will come out. And he uh, said, but the reason why I did it is because today is the birthday of, of Ursa. And he brought up a picture of Ursa. He such an important figure, a magnetic figure. So it was a guy who had this huge imagination. And, oh, he, by the way, he's the one who in 1984 at the uh, General Relativity Conference announced our result with, uh, with the Viking Land. Uh, I asked him to do it, and since it was the chairman, uh, the, uh, the, not the chairman, the, 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 micro, the, the final, final pitch, I said, well, without many comments, it was very precise, and he said, I just want to let you know that this new number that has been published in the variation of G is a hundred times or thereabout, less than what Professor Virag wanted, and that was it. So I asked him to do his favor, and he did it very kindly, because he was an extremely kind man. Yeah, but this black hole business should be. I'll try to <laughs> get in touch with Kenneth for it. Matt? There's another story, maybe it's the only one. Yeah. What happened when Heisenberg died? Oh, yeah. Please and tell. The one you the <laughs> but it was an apocryphal story, right? <laughs> what? Since he didn't die? Yeah? It's an apocryphal. A story. Okay. They said. <laughs> <laughs> the story said that, that Heisenberg said, that when he died and he went to the pearly gate, I think the same story, he would ask St. Peter what was quantum mechanics, and then he would ask God what is turbulent. <laughs> Isn't that the same? I don't even remember what came after that. And <laughs> what was it? God, or maybe St. Peter, yeah. explained it to him, ah. and Heisenberg said, you're wrong too. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not even It's a Pauli story. <laughs> Is it Pauli? I told that story. <laughs> I see. I see. I, I keep hearing it about Pauli. God is explaining at the blackboard, and Pauli is shaking his head. He says, two mistakes already. Costas, do you have a question? Yes. You never said us how you ended up working with the Vatican. No, I didn't end up working with the Vatican. They read this book. Right, and uh, some of them read it, but it seems they were under, you, oh, first of all, because it was in Italian, so they read carefully. They only read Latin or Italian. No, <laughs> no that's important. Because how many books were published in English in SDI? Huge amount. Yeah? But as I said, politically, it was right, they were under pressure. As a matter of fact, the head of the, oh, and I can answer the question that I can for, the head of the SDI at that time it was General. Uh, very, very gentle, very courteous. Ask for a meeting with the ambassador of the Vatican at the United Nations. And he came, and he gave his whole presentation. He said, you know, the church should really, should really be in favor of this idea because we are suggesting defense against offensive, etc. And, um, and um, at the end, the ambassador was there, and I was there, and he says, well, you see, he said, I am not an expert in this business, but the gentleman here, I had their written or his writing a book, I forget what he said. So he asked me what. So we had this very long conversation with this head of the, the Strategic Defense Initiative, that was the name of it. And, um, and then he said, um, and he asked me, 
does the event in Nova but we book? And I said, well, I don't know, if they go to the bookstore, they will buy it, but I doubt it very much. He is the one who must have suggested to the ambassador to send a copy of my book to the event. When they read that, then they asked me to go to Rome, and I did. And I had dinner with the Pope, which was another of those experiences, because I came out of that dinner and I went to Trastevere to buy spaghetti and vongole because I was starving. <laughs> <laughs> because when you have dinner with the Pope, you're not supposed to eat until he is. And he was never, st was never starting because he was too excited about it. And he told me two things. That's why I understood why he's a Pope and I'm not. He said, I, I kept down with the chart and graphs, etc. And he said, do you know the, uh, the joke about the Polish uh, scientists? I said, no, you're holding this, I don't. Well, there was a professor in Poland who went to a summer school, and in the afternoon before lecture, he went up for a walk in the hills, and a bunch of students coming down the hill said, Professor, don't go there, because the people here, the local told them there is a, a very dangerous um, bear. And he said, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know there is. But I am perfectly, uh, perfectly okay, because I have my perfect defense. And he says, well, tell me, I have a twig in his hand. And he said, well, that's not the fact. He said, the bear doesn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, so he said, this is a, a game of perception. And then he said, second thing, he said, the Russians are very good at playing chess. The Americans are very good at playing poker. This is a poker game, not a chess game. If the Russians believe that it works, it works. In, in, independently of what they were telling you, because we're at the perception level, which is exactly what happened. So who am I going to explain that the earth is round, etc. when he understood everything? You know, so he said, thank you very much. But in the Russian, and a few days later, actually, Chernyenko, who was um, the successor of Brezhnev, perhaps, I think so, made a speech on April. Uh, Reagan's speech was March 23rd. Chernyenko was at the end of April, in which instead of saying, okay, you America want to, uh, want to, um, Bleed yourself to death with all the expenses, it will not work. So do it. That's it. You know, we wait on the other side of the river, wait for you. <coughs> but he didn't. He made a speech in which it was clear that they were thinking about this problem, had been thinking about this problem for many years. So he gave away. So the Pope was right. There was a perception there. So I think that the smart thing that Reagan did, not that he wanted to, I, I don't want to criticize him or embellish him, but the fact that he won a war of, how would I say, not nerves, a war of, um, perception against reality in a very simple very simple fashion. And so, uh, by the way, the, the document that these 20 people, I have this word number 21, so the 20 people gave to the Pope, he asked them not to divulge the content because it was just my personal talk, because he paid the trip for everybody. So everybody went there in his own content, not as representative of the institute, right? And so at that moment, nobody has ever, I ever heard one sentence coming out of any of there were, there were um, God was there, so I can testify to it. But, but in the speech that the Pope gave the year after that, I saw entire sentences <laughs> taken from that report. So that means that he read it. But the joke about that, let me finish with that. When he, when he finally gets received by a Pope in his library, were these 20 people, all with gray hair, almost. But there was young, one kid who was showing, I was KGB, they went to the Russian. As soon as the Pope spotted, went to him. And the guy was so embarrassed. You know. Because the Pope said, oh, but you're so young. How could you be such a scientist? And you send the radio. Of course, the guy could not say, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a KGB guy. So, so the Pope shook his hands and said, oh, you you must be so, must be so smart and so brilliant in the company of all these other people. So he knew how to take his vendetta out of, uh, out of this guy, who was there because he had to, not because he wanted to. <laughs> but he has a sense of humor that was a little bit having that moment. And anyway, he shook hands with everybody. And, um, and I remember uh, Garvin saying to the Pope, you know, I, um, uh, Richard said, um, I said, either I was a student or I worked with family, one of the two. The private club or whatever. Well, was not a student. He was, I think, a student. Was a student. In Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago. <laughs> and so uh, I remember that moment, I still have the picture. And the Pope said, oh, and the Pope so they started exchanging Exchange because this pub was very knowledgeable. I mean, he was a university professor, was not just that. So he knew. Uh, so he told me very much that evening uh, for <coughs> bringing in something that he never bothered to look at. Um, but then he asked me to do this meeting and said, "You know, this is going to cost at that time fifty thousand dollars at least. No problem. But remember that that this document is my document, and no 
promise will not go out anyway. And he did. Everybody kept his promise not to do. So it was an interesting meeting because very friendly, by the way. The Russian and the American were extremely friendly in the same hotel. At midnight, the Russian always pulled out the water of water out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where, but they always had one. And they were working, uh, were working till very late at night, and it was really, uh, of course, with different point of view, uh, evidently. But it was not. It was. Um, they have a very. They were very happy, very glad when you ordered the Pope invited them, and um, and um, and I invited the best of the America to offer under the suggestion of the Garvin, and the Russian will let them choose whoever they want to choose the next time. But only one was a KGB kid, it was very embarrassed. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good that was Great. Well, I think Victoria will hang around if you want to ask any more questions. Let's thank Victoria again.